Well, I um, want to welcome you to this very excellent panel that we have here today. I'm going to introduce our speakers today, and then we're going to have a really great discussion on the Sahel, uh, Northern Africa, and just generally what the conflict and security landscape looks like today in Africa. So first, I want to introduce our distinguished speakers, who we have a lot of expertise in this uh, panel today. I'll start with, um, right down in the middle, we have Mr. Lalali. Uh, Mr. Lalali is the acting director and concurrently the deputy director of the Africa Center for the Study on and Research on Terrorism. Among his primary responsibilities are leading the design and development of the center's counterterrorism early warning system. He also manages a team of senior analysts that conducts policy analysis, studies, the synthesis, and audits on terrorism in Africa. He's provided a lot of assistance to consultants uh, appointed by the African Union uh, to the African Anti-Terrorism Mo uh, Model Law and has contributed to the development of the principles and guidelines on human and people's rights while countering terrorism in Africa. And this was later then adopted by the Africa Commission on Human and People's Rights. He also led the monitoring process to, of ratification of the African and Universal Counterterrorism Instruments, in addition to providing a lot of other various responsibilities as part of the African Union and UN joint missions and programs across many different UN bodies. Um, now I also want to talk to my furthest on my right, which is on your left, uh, is uh, Mr. Uh, Wasim Nasser. And he's a French journalist who has been monitoring jihadist groups for more than a decade for the French news outlet France 24 in French, English, and Arabic. He has conducted multiple investigations and interviews in this regard, and he's the author of um, a great book that we will get into. But what I also want to mention, and I'm sure some of you already saw, is that he's recently had an interview with Al-Qaeda in, uh, in the Islamic Maghreb, and we may be able to get into that uh, a little bit uh, today. Lastly, but not least, I want to uh, introduce uh, Mr. Rami George uh, Khoury. And he is an international syndicated political columnist and book author, journalist in residence, and director of global engagement at the American University of Beirut, and a non-resident senior fellow at Harvard Kennedy School. He was executive editor of the Beirut-based uh, Daystar newspaper, the editor-in-chief of the Jordan Times, and was awarded the Pax Christi International Peace Prize in 2006. He teaches or lectures annually at American University of Beirut and Northeastern, and has been a fellow and visiting scholar at Harvard, Mount Holyoke, um, Princeton, Syracuse, Northeastern, Villanova, Oklahoma, and Stanford Universities. Uh, he has also served in the Joint Advisory Board of Northwestern University's Jun Journalism School in Doha, Qatar. So thank you uh, for making time today. So I want us to first start with discussing the uh, broader landscape that we have on security in Africa. And for this, I want to ask Mr. Lalali, could you tell us a bit more of what the Africa Center for the Study and Research on Terrorism does? And based on the assessments from your time at the center, could you provide us a bit of an overview of the current threat landscape in Africa and other opportunities? Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, the, the, the center that uh, I represent was established about 20 years ago. Uh, it was uh, as a reaction of uh, a, uh, an increasing threat of terrorism, or realization of the threat of terrorism and violent extremism that started as early as 1999, uh, which uh, translated into the adoption of the Convention of the Prevention and Combating of Terrorism, um, you know, uh, two years or at least three years before 9-11. Uh, so this shows that Africa was already anticipating the consequences of such threats and the necessity to develop the legal framework, but also the institutions that will assist member states in developing their counterterrorism capacity. And this is where we came in as, a, as an institution. Uh, in terms of the threat, I mean, despite all these efforts, uh, we were, as the situation uh, presents itself, it, show, uh, it, it indicates that as if we were taken by surprise. 
-hmm. However, the indicators were there. Uh, the reports uh, were, uh, were published and shared with member states. I have to recall that uh, the center works in collaboration with focal points at national levels mm -hmm. and regional levels, and these are designated institutions that exchange information, intelligence, analytical reports on terrorism uh, in the respective countries or region. CAIAS collates that information, analyzes it, and then turn it back into various early morning products. And um, this is why CAIAT has been tasked also in establishing what we call a list of terrorist groups and individuals, the mm -hmm. African Arrest Warrant, in addition to guiding uh, the policy of the African Union uh, and uh, developing the counterterrorism capacity of member states and assist, assessing also their capacities in that sense. So we have a mandate of monitoring their um, implementation of international instruments, but also assessing their readiness to prevent and combat terrorism and provide them with guidance. So we've been involved in developing national and regional counterterrorism strategies, uh, plans of actions for the prevention and combating of terrorism. And recently we engaged in enhancing the focal point community whereby we had a desk officer or a small office in a department looking at CT. We're promoting a multi-agency approach mm -hmm. through the creation of what we call now the counterterrorism fusion centers. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for that really, really great and a comprehensive overview of the work that you do. I want to zoom in now from sort of looking at things more broadly across Africa and sort of the assessments that you do um, at the center and sort of ask uh, the resident journalists at the table here if you could tell us a bit more on the Sahel, if we can zoom into that region a bit more. And could you provide us with a bit of an overview on Islamic State and Al-Qaeda threat landscape in the Sahel? sort of what the similarities and differences are. And if you want, you can also sort of go into a discussion on the responses to those threats. Uh, great, uh, thank you for, for having me. I have to, uh, to say first that I was very pleased to hear an explanation of what was mediation, mediation about by a former speaker, because I guess that for investigative journalism, it's a little bit like mediation, mm -hmm. because you have to get uh, primary sources talking about primary things yeah. which will make uh, or allow the politicians to make uh, decisions and allow the general public to have a real awareness of one problem or another and this is a bit forgotten sometimes yeah. the role what's the role of the mediator and what's the role of the journalist uh, that being said uh, about the Sahel we have really case uh, uh, study uh, today because it was what I used to call the Sahel exception Mm -hmm. meaning that up to 2019, the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda weren't fighting in this area. Mm -hmm. There was some kind of tolerance between mm -hmm. them. I wouldn't talk about cooperation, but tolerance. Tolerance because of the human factor, you know, mm -hmm. because leaders on both sides used to know each other, mm -hmm. which permitted uh, some kind of tolerance at one point. But the leaders being eliminated through war or through uh, uh, French strikes, for example. Mm -hmm. The second uh, in the row uh, commanders didn't have the same relation, the same passive among them, which mm -hmm. means that war uh, between the two groups arrived also to the Sahel. Mm -hmm. And one could think that it's maybe uh, a good thing for them to fight, but actually not. Mm -hmm. Because when they fight, they tend to radicalize the recruits on both sides, mm -hmm. and there's no way back. Um, you talked about the interview I conducted. Actually, it was questions that I sent to the head of Akim. Yeah. And he said for the first time on this level of responsibility in Al-Qaeda, he uh, described them as khawarij. Yeah. The, the most, uh, the synonym in English could be maybe a deviance. And he said there is only war between us, mm -hmm. meaning there is no way back. And this tends to radicalize recruits and also populations because some populations in those areas have no other choice than being on one side or the other, you know, not for political reasons, not for dogmatic reasons, but for security reasons. Yeah. But time passing through, as Mr. Kafi said, people who get into those groups, but they get dogmatic. Yeah. You know, I get to listen to audios, for example, of Mohammed Kufa, who's the head of Al-Qaeda in central Mali, and he was explaining to new recruits back in 2018 what were the sources of the conflict, dogmatic conflict between Al-Qaeda mm -hmm. and the Islamic State, starting Iraq 2003. You see, this is, is to be taken into consideration. The lack of, uh, of, um, of uh, assessment of those groups as groups with a political agenda using terrorism is a really a real huge gap in knowing how to handle those groups, okay? 
because they don't do just terrorism for terrorism. They do terrorism, they blow up cars, not for the fun of it. They blow up cars, they kill people for political reasons. And once you get to understand that, you, have, you can make the right assessment, you know. Uh, I'll give you just another example about the Sahel, like the warring situation between them since French departure uh, from Mali, mm -hmm. actually, it gave them, it gave them uh, a no-fly zone, actually, yeah. above Mali, which wasn't existing before, mm -hmm. meaning that Al-Qaeda uh, leaders got to meet more easily on one hand, and they got also to entrench themselves more and more in the local yeah. uh, so societies, because they, they frame themselves as defending those societies against whom? Against the Islamic State, mm -hmm. which is killing since March 2022, mm -hmm. unchecked in uh, northern, uh, eastern uh, Mali. So the scope, military scope of the Islamic State is getting wider and wider in what we call the three border region between uh, Burkina Faso, Niger, and Mali, mm -hmm. the military scope of its actions. So at the doors of Gawo, they attack the seat and they stay like 20 kilometers away. They can gather in numbers, which wasn't possible before, not because of the might of the French army, but mm -hmm. because of the fear of mm -hmm. being hit by drones, which is an irrational fear, actually. Yeah. And at the same time, at the same time, uh, you have Al-Qaeda that is entrenching itself more and more politically among those populations, providing for them, protecting them, and, and, having learned from the lessons of 2012, when they controlled northern Mali, they are not that harsh in implementing Sharia law on local populations, meaning no more cutting hands, mm -hmm. uh, no more public uh, uh, sentences, and because also they lack human resources, mm -hmm. they are delegating to local uh, religious figures in order to judge in their name. And when I say judge, uh -huh. like judge who's gonna have the right to use this whale, who's gonna have the right to use this land. And like very local disputes, mm -hmm. but it's a quick and effective justice for local populations mm -hmm. who are seeking this kind of justice and seeking a kind of security that only those who are on the ground are able to provide for them, you see? and. Uh, one really important thing in this warring situation that before it was really um, like uh, the, the, the line was mostly ethnic, yeah. like mostly uh, Fulanis in the ranks of the Islamic State from Niger, mm -hmm. mostly uh, Tuaregs and Arabs in the ranks of uh, Al Qaeda in northern Mali, and Fulanis of uh, central Mali. Today, in the last warring situations between those two groups, in Ansongo, for example, mm -hmm. it was Fulanis on both sides, mm. you see? And once this, uh, this digue, as we say in French, once this, uh, uh, this um, uh, obstacle falls down, if the Islamic State gets to recruit Fulanis in central Mali, it will also enlarge the scope of its, of its, uh, of its uh, capabilities. So the, the, the particular thing is that it's uh, those same, same populations that are allowing Al-Qaeda to go further south, mm -hmm. like Burkina Faso, the Gulf of Guinea, as it was said, uh, and even Ivory Coast on the northern borders, those same uh, populations are preventing Islamic State from going further south. So who's containing, at the end of the day, the Islamic State? It's the warring situation with Al-Qaeda. Yeah. Uh, so this is it's to be taken into consideration. And one last thing about those two groups, mm -hmm. and we talked uh, a bit earlier about the, the Taliban, and all those who have some historic background, they know that the groups that were labeled terrorists or insurgencies, at one point in time, you have to sit down and talk with those who are willing to talk. So there's no breakthrough. <laughs> there's no breakthrough about yeah. this in international uh, politics, uh, you say. And, uh, and in this situation, you have Al-Qaeda today, at least in the Sahel, yeah. willing to talk. Mm -hmm. And they said it many times, willing to talk to governments, willing to talk yeah. to, uh, even they said that the war with France was framed in the mm -hmm. Sahel and in Africa. Mm -hmm. It was said in a communique, it was said in audios, and it was said to me in an indirect way because the Arabic language is so rich mm -hmm. by the head of, uh, of Akim. He goes, uh, Western uh, leaders don't understand what are our goals, meaning our goals are very local. We are not talking good guys and bad guys. We are talking about parties who are willing to talk. And negotiation and mediation are also parts of uh, stabilization. It doesn't mean that you'll be friends with the persons you are, who you are talking to. But it means that you have ways to talk, meaning ways to make pressure 
also. This is part of international politics. And in my sense, and my humble opinion, mm -hmm. in this uh, war on terrorism, we forgot that negotiations and mediations are also part of the game, mm -hmm. especially when we are talking about insurgencies entrenched in, in areas in Africa or other places since decades. So when you have an insurgency, you cannot treat an insurgency as a terror attack in Paris or as a terror attack at Grand Bassam, as, mm -hmm. as it was said. When you have an insurgency entrenched in the population and entrenched in the economic tissue of a region, you have to find ways to talk. It doesn't mean it's going to succeed, yeah. but you have to find ways to talk. So this is really a different of approach today between the Islamic State and, uh, and Al-Qaeda, the most prominent groups uh, actually in the Sahel region. In the Sahel, the, 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 uh, what's called Jama'at Nusrat al-Islam al-Muslimin, meaning the, the Al-Qaeda branch in the Sahel region, mm -hmm. is the only success today with the Shabaab mm -hmm. of Al-Qaeda. Yeah. Political success mm -hmm. with a strategy. Yeah. You see, they failed all over the place in other, in other places. So they are building on something mm -hmm. because the objective reasons that lead to such, uh, 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 to such uh, situation are always there. And also, at, as it was said, the military solutions aren't the only solutions, yeah. you see? They are backfiring, and if you wish, we can later talk about the Wagner impact, yeah. the after effect okay. of Wagner, which was mostly beneficial for jihadi groups. Yeah. And you know, what you've said is so comprehensive and you know, I see our automatic parallels in other areas like in Al-Shabaab, for example, in Somalia, this idea of embedding yourself into the local mm. dynamics, providing clan mediation tactics, mm. sort of providing an alternate governance and justice system, and tying yourself to the fortunes of the public and how that can uh, support the longevity of the group, right? They and do politics, actually. Yes. Exactly. They do yeah. politics, and terrorism is a mean to yes. achieve their political goals. Yes. This should be said. Absolutely, <laughs> and I'm, I'm grateful that you brought that up. <laughs> now I want to shift gears a little bit and move on to the Northern Africa. And I'm going to ask uh, you, um, uh, Mr. Rami Kuri, if you could kindly provide us a little bit of an overview of uh, what in your assessment, are the conditions that give way to groups like Al-Qaeda and Islamic State in uh, mostly majority Arab states uh, in North Africa? Uh, thank you very much. I'm honored uh, and delighted to be here and uh, take part in, uh, in this panel and, uh, and the whole uh, forum. Uh, I've been following events in the Arab world for the last 50 years, since uh, 1972 when I graduated from college and I've been working as a journalist, mostly in the Mashrik and the uh, Levant area, Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, Palestine, but traveling around the region, but tracking the, the regional trends uh, for about 50 years. And uh, what's fascinating is that uh, the kinds of issues we're addressing today, uh, security threats, terrorist groups, extremist groups, uh, mass uh, illegal migration, these things are all new. Uh, in the 60s and 70s and 80s, we didn't have this kind of uh, threat to any serious extent. There might have been a few little individuals here or there. But what we did have over the years, and what is so important to recognize today, is the uh, degradation of the well-being, the material well-being, and the sense of dignity of individuals and individual families and these are multiplied by the tens of millions to the 430 million Arabs we have today. They're not all degraded, uh, but probably around 60 to 70 percent of the entire Arab region is, according to UN statistics and many others, about 60 to 70 percent of all Arab individuals and families are uh, in a situation of food insecurity, water insecurity, low quality health care low quality education, poor job prospects, uh, very uneven application of the rule of law, widespread corruption, uh, and, and other things, uh, but I'll stop with those. Those material things uh, are incredibly important in the progression and the spread of discontent among individual people or families and neighborhoods because their fundamental material needs, not just for uh, feeling good and 
achieving their potential, their fundamental material needs for survival. So this is a biological as well as an ideological issue. People cannot survive in many parts of the Arab region. We see this in North Africa very clearly. The two big uh, uprisings started in Tunisia and, and Egypt, no accident. Uh, everybody thought they were doing great because their ex imports or exports were growing by 6%. But at the family level, at the community level, things were deteriorating. We could see this back in the 1970s. The first signs of it were the rapid expansion of the Muslim Brotherhood, which was the nonviolent uh, uh, community-based group that expressed Islamic values in political and communal terms. Whether they were legal, as, as they were in Jordan, or illegal in other countries, they kept expanding, expanding, expanding. And we also started to see the, the large-scale uh, out-migration of uh, educated young Arabs, men and women, who just saw that they felt they had no future in their countries for some reason or another. So you could go back and trace the uh, evolution of the discontent that many individual Arabs felt. And the troubling thing now is uh, we have uh, today two mechanisms uh, by, that we didn't have back in the 60s and 70s and even 80s, by which we can understand very clearly the sentiments and the complaints and aspirations of ordinary Arab men and women all over the region. And these are polling, which is done now regularly by uh, several very respected professional polling groups uh, anchored in the Arab region, the Arab Barometer and the Arab Center for Social and Economic Development, uh, Social and Political uh, Research, uh, the, the Doha Center here. Uh, these two surveys across the whole Arab region every other year provide us an, an unrivaled insight into what ordinary Arabs feel and what they complain about. The other thing that we have is, starting in 2010, the biggest regional uprising of ordinary Arab men and women in the history of the Arab world, I would say. It's certainly the modern Arab world based on these individual states. And so the consequence of mass deprivation, when I say mass, again, I remind you, I'm talking about 60 to 70 percent of ordinary Arab men and women. You don't see it much here in the Gulf because these are societies that are quite wealthy and treat their citizens well, provide them with what they need, including in, here in Qatar, incredible education and cultural opportunities, and now sports as well, which is important. Um, but the vast majority of Arab men and women uh, are uh, suffering. Uh, and there's a, there's a pattern that is so clear, and I've, I've watched this all my life, and people around my neighborhood where I lived in Lo Lebanon or, or Jordan or other places, People first get irritated if they turn on, their, turn on their water faucet, there's no water. They get irritated if electricity gets cut off or the price triples. They get irritated when uh, bread prices and, and gasoline prices go up suddenly. So irritation is the first sentiment. And, th and then they start feeling stress. They don't have enough money to buy the enough food they need or the medical care for their families. Or somebody uh, else gets priority to put their kid in a hospital or a university to the, their kids because of corruption and, and influence. So th th this trajectory goes on to a sense of being uh, angry and then being humiliated and then being degraded and ultimately being dehumanized. And a dehumanized person becomes a terrorist, goes and shoots up innocent people, whoever they may be. This, traje this trajectory is so clear now in the, in the region and if you look at any of the material uh, dimensions of life, health, water, housing, etc., uh, and any of the political dimensions, which is the second one, that these people who are so degraded by their difficult living conditions, um, about 70% of Arabs are poor or vulnerable. Uh, means they can just barely cover their monthly expenses or they can't. About 65-70% of Arabs are food, uh, have food de deficits. They can't get enough food for a normal, uh, healthy life. Uh, what this situation leads to uh, are difficult choices that individuals or families have to make. Uh, 
Some of them immigrate legally. Some of them immigrate illegally. Uh, some of them join uh, activist groups and societies, civil society groups for human rights and other things. Some of them join militant groups, like not, they don't go right away to Al-Qaeda and ISIS, they probably start with somebody else and then ultimately if they're uh, completely hopeless, they, they go to some of the extremist groups. But this happens because along with their material deficiencies, they are totally politically powerless. And we've seen this in the last decade so clearly, the uprisings across the Arab region, where you've had uh, leaders overthrown, but not systems of governance. And the one example that uh, succeeded, Tunisia, has reverted now to an uh, autocratic uh, system. And most of the others that made little reforms here or there have reverted to autocratic authoritarian control uh, through digital media controls and, and uh, other means. So there's a total, absolute sense of helplessness by individuals and groups of people who have tried every possible means to live a decent life by voting, by joining civil society groups, by respecting the law, by working hard, by going to school, paying their taxes, whatever. They've done everything and they tried to demonstrate peacefully. They've tried everything and nothing works. And the ultimate uh, uh, result in the recent years, in the last 10 years, the most significant thing that's happened has been the uh, consolidation of power by the authoritarian powers across the region. And I've watched this close up in, in the, in the Mashriq area, but in, in, in the Maghreb area, it's the same thing. So if you look at Algeria, Morocco, Mauritania, uh, Tunisia, uh, Egypt, uh, people at the top, or the political groups, or the military groups at the top, they listen, they try to do little things here and there, but in the end, they don't really make serious reforms, and they don't really share decision-making powers. The ability of Arab modern authoritarianism to perpetuate its rule is one of the striking problems we have in the region today. And this is one of the reasons why you're seeing the continued expansion of Al-Qaeda and ISIS and other groups um, of, of that nature. I mean, this is a desperate move for a young man or woman to go and, and join one of these groups, but they do. Uh, they do it because they have, uh, they have no other option. Um, so I think uh, my point, my main point, and I'll stop after that, is just to point out this uh, foundation of material deprivation in every aspect of life that's necessary for biological survival, as well as ideological and uh, psychological well-being. Every dimension of life is, is people are uh, in, living in deficits. Uh, and along with this, by the way, there's massive inequality. We're the most unequal region, the Arab region, including the, the Maghreb and the Mashriq, uh, where small groups of very wealthy people dominate the majority of the uh, economy and the money, and the masses of society are uh, among the uh, poor uh, and vulnerable. So as well as deprivation, there's massive inequality, political helplessness. So we need to understand that terrain. What, uh, on top of it, the, the last point is international powers and some regional powers go into individual Arab countries. And we see this in North Africa, you see it in Tunisia, you see it in Libya, uh, where different Arab countries go in and help one group uh, or another. Um, and the integrity of society starts to fray and, and in some cases break down, as in, as in Libya. The ultimate uh, result is the sovereign nature of these independent countries uh, is losing much of its, some or much of its sovereignty. We're seeing a process of de-sovereignization where decisions within Arab countries, if you take Libya, if you take Tunisia, if you take Egypt, you take uh, any Arab Sudan, any Arab country, most of the big decisions cannot be made purely on the basis of what the leaders or people of that country feel. They need to get some kind of approval or support from outside. Uh, so those are the main points I wanted to make at this stage. A lot of what you um, articulate has incredible implications for not just ensuring state consolidation, um, but also beyond that, sort of helping to 
understand prevention efforts to prevent the recruitment uh, of violent extremists, and also perhaps at the back end, some of the information you provide can give insights into why people join the groups in the first place, which can help us understand how we can off ramp individuals through exit programs. So there's a lot of implications of what you said. I want to go back to uh, Mr. Lalai, and I wanted to talk a little bit more about the center, but I wanted to know that you know, I see that as part of the Continental Terrorism Early uh, Warning System that's based out in the center, your organization assesses the capacity and readiness of member states as well as um, uh, of those of uh, different regional actors. And often you're trying to suss out sort of this counterterrorism gaps and, you know, other technical and operational capacity needs. I wonder, you know, among the African Union member states as well as those regional mechanisms that you mentioned before, um, what are some of the ca capacity gaps that they have identified and perhaps brought to your case and sort of requested assistance with, or that you through your own assessments have identified? Uh, well, thank you. Just um, before uh, I answer that question, if you allow me two or three minutes to give you an overview of the threat and how we perceive it and how Absolutely. it progressed. Um, I think if we uh, go back 20 years ago, mm -hmm. the uh, threat of terrorism was mainly in North Africa. Yeah. And now North Africa is basically the least hit region on the continent. Last yeah. year, for instance, we registered about 70 terrorist attacks, whereas now the Sahel and West Africa are the most violent, uh, I think, regions when it comes to terrorism in relation to the number of deaths, uh, but also in, in relation to the number of victims, yes. seconded by Central and Eastern Africa, and then comes now Southern Africa with Mozambique yeah. in the last few years. Uh, so you see the threat um, evolved quite rapidly, and our anticipation was, you know, as of 2006, I remember putting a slide up and saying, okay, it's going to go from the Atlantic to the, uh, to the Red Sea, meaning from Mauritania all the way to Djibouti, still having at that time Al-Qaeda in mind. Uh, however, we did not anticipate the emergence and uh, I would say the storm or the tsunami of the Islamic State on the African continent. However, with the emergence of the Islamic State and the small affiliated groups that were small in 2012 or 2013, they are being much more fast in terms of acquiring territory, in terms of, I would say, geographic reach, and now the expansion itself is dictated by the movement of the Islamic State affiliates more than Al-Qaeda itself. What I see Al-Qaeda as being a much more resilient, um, I don't know, because of age, maybe the Al-Qaeda operatives have difficulties in moving that quickly, but they're really slow, they're taking their time, they're trying to in entrench themselves into local politics, and they I think... They do you, politics. They do politics, exactly, yes, and, and, and I think, you know, in the article that you put, uh, you know, the, the fact that they have the flag, the national flags, it means that they are already identifying themselves with local politics, and this means a lot. This is a threat, but also an opportunity. However, the Islamic State itself is a fast-moving organization. This is the, uh, you know, it's as fast as the internet connection, let's put it this way. And they're really eager to occupy as much territory and advance as, as, as fast as possible. Um, there is a tour of war, indeed, between the two organizations. We had anticipated at some point in time that with the elimination of both leaders, there could be a rapprochement. Uh, however, with the last video, uh, you shouldn't have done that interview, you messed up all our theories, is that, <laughs> that we know that the, co the war will still be ongoing and the conflict will still be ongoing between the two organizations because in some of the reports we were anticipating a rapprochement which would have created this mega terrorism uh, or terrorist uh, group that will eventually take by storm uh, the, the African continent. So you see now, we went from the Atlantic to uh, the, uh, the Red Sea, but we're going now to, you know, Mozambique and the southern part of, uh, of, of the continent. And uh, we're seeing the Islamic State as being, in terms of expansion, the greatest threat to the continent itself. Whereas Al-Qaeda, and I think from the interview, and then also, I would say the maneuvers, especially of Jinim, is trying to position itself as a viable political interlocutor whether it is in the Algiers uh, Accord, uh, you know, that meeting that they had with the, uh, the community leaders in northern Mali. And then they have a common enemy, two common enemies nowadays. Uh, one of them is Islamic State and the other one is Wagner. So I think one can bank on such uh, commonality, I think, in terms of uh, 
in terms of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, two objectives that are common to everyone in that region and try to engage with them some kind of dialogue or open lines of communication. There is a need in that region in terms of Al-Qaeda to weed out the locals from the foreign terrorist fighters. Locals, you cannot eliminate them. At some point in time, you have to go through a dialogue, a discussion, maybe a reconciliation uh, program, a reconciliation, uh, I would say, process, whereby you weed out most of these leadership. And I think we have potential great opportunity, again, in, uh, with the Jinim, because you have Iyad Agali, who's been in various rebellions in the past. Uh, he still has his networks, he still has his followers uh, in northern Mali, but he's still, whether we like it or not, or whether it's, uh, it, it is clear or not, but he has, still has some ears in Bamako that could listen to him, which pro could provide some, um, I, I would say, opportunity, at least from that point of view. The Islamic State is completely different. Uh, and, uh, and I think this is what we need to do, two things. Eliminate the threat as much as possible, but ensure that we have prevention programs, preventive measures to ensure that the threat doesn't progress, doesn't recruit uh, more uh, of our uh, individuals, and doesn't, you know, um, I, I would say, uh, 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 exploit the, weak, the weakness in many of our countries, in particular porosity of borders, which facilitates the uh, movement of terrorists, but also the ability of these terrorists to generate funds uh, and be able to, uh, to, to maintain their operations. Uh, let's not forget, many of these terrorist groups are also are their largest recruiters in many of the ill-administered ad areas. Uh, I think as an international community, we have excelled and learned from clearing territories, but not necessarily to control them or administer them. Uh, so there is a need to accompany both the city operations where a return of state institutions, the return of uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 basic services that should be provided to, uh, to individuals. Uh, and unfortunately, as, uh, as uh, Dr. Rami was saying, we're still looking at massive hierarchy of needs, where we're still looking at you know, basic security, food, shelter, water, education. And this is where we need to be investing in terms of uh, preventive measures. So now going back to the question, what are the major gaps? Uh, they are structural uh, in terms of building the right institutions, uh, and it's quite important. Building the right human resource, uh, you know, people that understand what they're looking at. Uh, second is trying to build state capacity, not only to counter the threat, but to respond to the needs of its populations. And in most of the cases, what we tell member states is that you should be doing what you need to be doing as a member state or a country. You know, these are basic services. Uh, if you look at, you know, the grievances and you compare them to the SDGs, for instance, they're not that different. So basically, it's got nothing to do with security. It's got to do with aspirations uh, and, and needs of populations. However, uh, I, I would say it's like recipes. There is talked about kebab last time. You know, the ingredients uh, and, and the type of spices and the, and, and the quantity of spices you put would be different from one country to another, one community to another. Uh, so, uh, and that's why there is a need for us to make specific tailored I would say approaches to communities that have been either radicalized, exposed to radicalization, or could become the potential, uh, I would say, um, clients, basically, or consumers of, uh, of, of radicalized uh, groups. Uh, the other aspects also are intelligence sharing and, and capacity, mobility. Uh, you know, we might have the intelligence, uh, and I'm sure Wasim could talk about Mali's capacity to project itself in that large territory. I think it's quick. As, a, as, as military or defense security forces of Mali, they do not have the capacity, even if you give them the intelligence, to project forces in the northern part of Mali to be able to operate. And hence, you know, the need to have the support of our partners uh, in terms of uh, transportation of our, uh, of our troops, training of our troops, and then equipping those troops to be able to operate. S uh, third is the issue of intelligence sharing. Many of our partners have presence on the continent, in particular in the Sahel. I think in Somalia, it's better. They share with Amisom and the other troops, but in the Sahel, not as much as it should be. Uh, there is presence of our partners. They monitor, they have their drones, they have their satellite imagery, and they, they have the communication equipment which they monitor. But continuously, our member states complain about the fact that that intelligence is not being shared. And it's, you know, shared responsibility means also sharing of resources and sharing uh, also these means that can allow us to identify uh, the threat and, and be able to uh, um, 
manage it. I wouldn't say eliminate it because you would think it is, uh, you know, security centric, but then I say manage it in a sense that even if we pick up indicators of our possibilities, then we should be able to act upon these, uh, you know, quite quickly. And hence the importance of early warning for early reaction, because once the house is on fire, it's not the right time to ask, how did we get here? Put down the fire and then make sure that you build it on proper and solid uh, foundations. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, I was saying that that's a very impressive answer. You know, I can see what you mean by we have forces that can probably clear areas that are previously held by these groups, but we sort of sometimes have a tension with having enough um, uh, institutional structure to be able to hold those uh, areas and then sort of build, introduce um, those governance and other security structures at the domestic and sometimes very localized uh, areas. Also, you know, this idea of uh, intelligence um, sharing and the need for these more tailored approaches, I see that this is perhaps part of uh, your center's goal in developing the fusion centers in the Sahel and East Africa. And I guess you're also moving to Sadak. I'm not sure if, it, if that's happened yet. But that's very interesting. Uh, I want to end um, here. And obviously, if we have time, we'll sort of keep going around. Uh, but I wanted to ask about Wagner right now. And I'm going to group in a bunch of questions together so we can get a bit more of this conversation going. But I wonder, you know, what impact will France's uh, recent departure in Burkina Faso have uh, for the country's fight against uh, militant Islamist extremists? But beyond that, we know that um, Togo and Benin have been seeing an uptick in attacks in this recent period, and you know, even as far as Niger and Cote d'Ivoire have also been seeing this impact. So generally, also consider how France's exit sort of affects those other regions. And if you can, could you tell us, um, from the Kremlin's perspective, how useful Wagner's operations in Mali and you know, potentially coming into uh, Burkina Faso if they do do that, uh, what, what, how useful is Wagner's operations to the diplomatic and other strategic goals of uh, Wagner? And ultimately, what impact does Wagner have on uh, jihadist uh, violence in the region? Well, uh, thank you for the, for the question. It will uh, allow me also to answer uh, what was uh, just uh, said. I just want to tell you that Wagner had a beneficial effect on jihadi groups. Yes. Al-Qaeda, okay, Wagner, they said they are Russians, uh, we're going to fight them, but they're not the primary source of their, uh, what we're going to do in northern Mali. Their primary enemy today is the Islamic State. The highest numbers of death is among the two groups mm. we are witnessing, we are seeing uh, combat situations that we could describe as medieval. Mm -hmm. You know, this is their biggest problem. Why? Because Islamic State can cannibalize Al Qaeda. Okay, Wagner. The only effect that Wagner had in Mali was political. It kicked the French out. They have no means on the ground. I wrote a piece for CTC West Point uh, a few months ago. And, uh, in which I, I had monitored the, the, the Wagner for one year, actually. Mm? They have no military success on the ground. Okay, we were talking about, uh, are they able to clear some areas? Mm -hmm. They cleared some areas, they cleared Mura, for example. What was the price? 400 civilians killed. The next day, Al-Qaeda came back and killed those who talked to the Malian TV. So what's the will? You know, the will is to score uh, numbers or to have military uh, effects, you see. They, they are present in uh, Menaka. They don't go out of their uh, barracks. When you talk to people who fought along them, mm, factions in northern Mali, they tell you they take our uh, fuel, they take our ammunition, they take our food, they don't have vehicles, they are not motorized, and they are not good fighters. So their effect is just political. Like, we are here, and France is out. That's it. But they don't have a positive, if I may say so, effect on jihadi groups, because the massacres committed in central Mali allowed Al-Qaeda to recruit more. We had an uptick in suicide volunteers, suicide attacks volunteers in central Mali. We had a no-fly zone that I just talked about, which is unprecedented in Mali since the beginning of jihadi movements there in the mid-2000s. It is the first time that they have a no-fly zone, 
meaning they cannot be hit from the air. They cannot be hit by a French or European uh, special forces, meaning Al-Qaeda leaders can meet more easily and the Islamic State can gather more easily and they can make much more complicated uh, attacks and they can even fight each other just under the nose of the Malian army and Wagner uh, mercenaries. I don't know if they are in Burkina Faso yet, we don't have any proof of this, despite many declarations uh, were made, but also when we talk about uh, do we give intelligence to uh, local, uh, local armies, uh, the Burkina Bay army asked a lot, the French army, to give them uh, intelligence to hit gatherings of, uh, of uh, uh, jihadi uh, regroupments, either Islamic State or uh, Al-Qaeda. But if you are from the French point of view, or even from the American point of view, or any Western country point of view, if you give those information, you are responsible about the outcome. Meaning, are civilians gonna be hit? You know, what are the rules of engagement? Okay? And what I said earlier also about the overrating of the capacities of drones. Drones created a big fear among jihadis, which was irrational, because drones are like flashlights. Okay, you have to have the good intelligence to put your flashlight. It's, they cannot monitor 5,000 uh, square kilometers of the Sahel 24 hours a day. Okay, so without good intelligence and without, uh, without good uh, rules of engagement, they are useless. But they created fear among jihadis, preventing them from gathering, etc., etc. But this fear is backfiring today because many uh, local governments think that it's a magic stick and that the Americans and the French can monitor everything and they are not giving them those information to help them out, you see? And when you talk about arming and, and, and training uh, local armies, it was done. Who made the coup d'etats? Those who were armed and trained by Western powers. You see, so it's a big dilemma. It's a big dilemma today, you see. Those uh, 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 juntas or uh, governments there, why are they leaning toward the Russians, for example? Because they don't, they don't ask them for accountability. They don't ask them for elections. They don't ask them for uh, gender rights. They don't ask them for, you know. So they just want to keep power. So this also is to be taken into, uh, into uh, consideration in this uh, in this ball game, if I, uh, if I may say so, uh, you see? So even though Wagner is present on the ground in Mali, but the military outcome of its presence shouldn't be overblown because it's uh, negative. And one more time, you can read the piece I just wrote and you ha you'll have the proof that it is actually uh, negative with what we said and much more, uh, much more, uh, much more uh, uh, details, you see? So the effect is just political, it's not military. And, and, and this is, also we were talking about targeted, uh, targeted populations. Okay, some populations feel targeted, but at the same time, you know, what leads to uh, uh, political violence? It's grievances meeting an ideology, either it's far left, far right, jihad, whatever, you know. So the grievances are real, and they are getting worse and worse. And today it's the black flags that are uh, being, uh, uh, being uh, stick out, and this is the people. I think this is jihad, you know. But for some populations, mm, they are changing their social status by entering this uh, this jihad issue. You see, from herders, very poor herders, looking for whales and uh, following cattle, they become fighters with the Nora. This should be also taken into consideration. Reasons that lead people to join jihadi groups are multiple. Reasons that lead them to leave are multiple. But the political aspect and the dogmatic aspect of it shouldn't be underrated. You know, nobody dies in a suicide attack without any reason. You see, so it should be considered. It should be considered. It should be taken into uh, into consideration when you are tackling uh, such uh, such issues. This is why I said, and I insisted on it, that the war between the two groups, that could sound something uh, uh, positive for the international community, isn't actually, because it is radicalizing on both uh, on both sides. And what was just said about that killing the the. Um, the leaders could lead to a union. Not at all. Killing the leaders cut the human link between the leaders that permitted the Sahel exception till 2019. 
And what led to the fight is the dogmatic issue. And you have a very good case study that I worked on in details. It was when Shikawo of Jama'at Ahl al-Sunnah, which had known as Boko Haram, vowed allegiance to Baghdadi, and how he was, he was kicked out from the group by Baghdadi, he was in Syria, you know? And Barnawi heading the group, then kicked out. So how come Baghdadi from Syria, which has no leverage on the Lake Chad, only the dogmatic leverage and maybe a little bit of money, can handle his troops and can decide who's gonna lead, you see? So you cannot just say, it doesn't exist. It's part of the uh, equation, you know? Like people, when they are, when we talk about the Islamic State, for example, how it became this uh, strong in Niger, it recruited bandits in 2018, you see? But bandits became dogmatic. Bandits wanna have, like run for money. Why would they join a jihadi group and, uh, and put all the eyes of the world on them and all military power to crush them. It's, if it's only about money and being bandits. You have bandits in northwestern uh, Nigeria. They are still bandits today, despite the presence of Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State. You see, so we, we, we have one more time uh, to think about this as uh, something uh, really uh, political. It has to be tackled uh, this way, in my, in, my humble, in my humble opinion. And mediation is part of the uh, solution too. I'm not saying it's only mediation, it's war and mediation, because they won't stop doing uh, what they're doing. You know? But they should be tackled not as plain bandits or just poor people who don't know what they're doing, you see? And this is something that I, I think that it was, this is one of the flows of war on terrorism, you know, because you cannot make war on a modus operandi. You, can, you make war against groups, against political groups, against uh, criminal groups, but you don't make war against just, uh, uh, no, sorry, like you make war on tanks. It's the same. I hope I was clear. <laughs> no, you were very clear, to be honest, that you were able to, you know, fully cover, uh, help us understand sort of why Wagner Group is uh, present in Mali in the first mm. place, right? That, you know, it's not necessarily to effectively, you know, I know in your piece for the CTC, mm. you articulated very well that, you know, they lack the uh, cap uh, logistical capacity because mm. most of the uh, resources are shared up in Ukraine. For that reason, they end up using more harsh uh, uh, engagement strategies that result in human, mm. human rights abuses, which just fuels the cycle of grievances that leads to more terrorist mm. recruitment. And they are unable to hold the ground. And they are unable to hold, yes. They, they, they don't do the second piece mm. that is really critical, hold and then allow enough time for rebuilding. Um, I have just one quick follow-up, then we can move on and, and, and close with you, sir. Um, how would um, the threat environment be different if French forces had not departed Mali or Burkina Faso? Well, I have a, I think that departing Mali was inevitable. Mm? Whatever mm -hmm. the, uh, the mm -hmm. situation was, because it was too long, too costly, and with no, uh, with no real outcome, because we go back to the same issue, that you, France cannot do the job uh, instead of local governments. And if local governments uh, don't have the will mm -hmm. to invest, you know, in services, in justice, and not only in military, uh, military action, well, France cannot do it for them, uh, you see? Mm -hmm. Are they willing today to invest more than money? That, that is the big question, you know, accountability, yeah. uh, governance, uh, corruption. You cannot, you cannot do, and, and this, it's really contradictory, you see, because when, as Western power, as United States, as France, or the European Union, ask for such, uh, mm -hmm. uh, for such uh, uh, for such issues, well, uh, they are not met very well uh, in uh, in some countries. You yes. see, so it's a double. Uh, so you want military help, but you want you don't want to make the, uh, the 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 political evolutions that uh, Western countries are asking for. So you see, okay, Western countries are not helping us, so we'll seek we'll seek this at another place. 
meaning Russians, etc., who don't have this kind of, uh, uh, of, uh, of um, uh, issues to handle with the local government. So it's really tricky for Western diplomacy to tackle, uh, to tackle this issue. I'm not saying it is, uh, it, is easy, uh, it is easy at all, you see. The fact is that after 10 years of uh, French engagement and billions being spent, the situation worsened. That's a fact. But is it, is it because of France, you know? Who is responsible? Look at, at Afghanistan, you see? And you have to, at one point to admit, you have at one point to admit that you cannot resume a country to its capitals and its major cities. You have to look what's happening all over the country. You know, the Taliban couldn't have took over Afghanistan just like that without popular support. That's reality, yeah. you know? So what are you willing to do as a Western country? Do you want to impose your views and your ways of doing on those countries yeah. or not? Those are really philosophical questions, actually, uh, because yeah. we have like more than 20 years to look at. Yeah. Uh, more than 20 years to look at. Al-Qaeda started with a few hundred, yeah. not even a few hundred. Look at the situation today. Yeah. So there are reasons for this. Uh, for this. You know, yeah. I just, there's the Levantine uh, say that says you have to uh, you have to lay your carpet mm, uh, regarding the size of your legs, meaning you have to have an ambition yeah. which which fits what you can and you cannot do. Yeah. You see, so what's the ambition? Huh? Yeah. What was the ambition of France and Mali and Northern Mali? Is to have uh, uh, nightclubs in Gao, is to uh, make a secular uh, uh, society all over uh, the Sahel, or is it just to secure? Yeah. You know, you see? So if it's just to secure, you have many communiques, for example, from Jnim and from Al Qaeda, and in the last uh, questions I asked ahead of Al Qaeda, yeah. saying that they consider, at least this branch of Al Qaeda, that the war with France is in Africa and Sahel, yeah. meaning the French territory isn't concerned. Yeah. And this was said before the arrival of Russian troops. Yes. So France could have capitalized politically on it by saying mission accomplished, yeah. the French territory isn't targeted, we yeah. can leave Mali. But they didn't. Why? Because it's war against terrorism. And you cannot take what terrorists are saying seriously, which is a political mistake. At the same time, the Americans and the Taliban were talking yeah. on the same table. And what you know? What you're saying dovetails in so nicely with uh, the the final question. And we have about five minutes, um, and so I'm going to ask you a big question <laughs> to answer in five minutes. But it dovetails nicely in this idea that, in some ways, wanting to impose your own ways of thinking, sort of your own ways of doing, uh, regardless of taking into consideration the political realities that are occurring in these countries, uh, can be detrimental. And this is something that you have written a lot about. Um, and I just wonder, you know, if you can talk about uh, you alluded. To to it a little bit earlier on, but if you talk about the influence of foreign and regional powers can have within Arab states and the potential impacts this can have on the state's sovereignty. Thank you. I want to follow up those very important comments that were just made. Um, you know, when you look at this situation at any level, I, start, I looked at it at the community level, the home level, the individual person's level, and, and how that generates big social movements and uprisings and uh, some terrorism, a lot of migration, other things. But when you look at it at a global level, and this is what we're talking about with foreign armies uh, coming into the region, uh, which we're, the, the, you know, the Western armies have been coming into the Middle East, the North Africa and, and the Mashrik, uh, Maghreb, uh, Mashrik region, Levant, since Napoleon, since 1798. They haven't stopped. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's more foreign military intervention now than ever before in our region. Uh, the fascinating thing, if you look at the, go back to the Maghreb, the, the, the data that we have from recent surveys uh, from across the Arab region, about 80% of Arabs say that they feel that, that the Arab people form some kind of unity, some kind of one nation, something. They're sovereign states, but they feel Arab, they feel part of, uh, uh, of something. And about 80% of Arabs all over the region also see the United States and Israel as their two biggest threats to their countries. And what do we see now? The United States and Israel coming into the region to try to create coalitions to fight terrorism and to fight Iran uh, with Arab countries, Israel and the United States, while 80% of Arabs see Israel and the United States as the greatest threat uh, to themselves. So there's a massive 
a problem here in really having a coherent policy uh, to deal with terrorism as a security threat only, as a military threat. You have to deal with it, but you need political tools, you need socioeconomic development, and what was said, you need to talk to these people. The local people, they're local people. They didn't come from the moon. The people from outside, you might ask them to go back or send them out. But there's a great problem in, in overemphasizing military responses to problems that emanate from political uh, deficiencies and social and economic deprivation, combined with an arrogant attitude by the governments, combined with a sense of total helplessness by the ordinary people. That creates a very volatile uh, mix. Uh, and the answer to it is, uh, is, is political and attitudinal. You have to deal with the people in your societies. And this is why Al-Qaeda learned after its first attempts, uh, when they got into Syria you know, in their second attempt, they started trying to create links with local people. And in Yemen, they tried to do the same thing to get some kind of legitimacy. So I think when we look at this issue, we have to look uh, at broader uh, identities of people, what motivates them, um, and, and how to respond to their uh, sense of humanity with more effective political, social, economic, and some military responses. That is a wonderful way to wrap up our uh, discussion, acknowledging the reality that militarized solutions are not the panacea, They're just like we've been hearing before, but that we need a more holistic uh, approach that acknowledges the political realities, the drivers for these conflicts and uh, potential solutions and responses to uh, addressing um, the state's needs. Uh, at this time, I want to end this panel. I want to thank our excellent uh, speakers today. We're grateful that you made time to speak with us. And uh, we'll allow Colin to come and transition us into the next uh, section.